degrees. And in fact, reduced decarbonization gives us very little in the way of climate relief over the next 25 years. And where in contrast, reducing SLCPs is not the main thing to do for long-term climate change, but really does give us relief over the next 25 years. That's probably about the best thing we could possibly do to reduce damages from climate change over the next 20 to 25 years is to target SLCPs. And as the slide shows, reducing air pollution will prevent millions of premature deaths per year, millions of tons of crop losses. So by having these um, goals put in place, the these benefits that we could get to, the solutions uh, that CCAC can offer are really ways to put into place the SLCP reductions that we can get to and to put them in place quickly. Right, that's that's the idea too. Getting SLCP reductions by 2050 is not our goal. Our goal is by 2030, by the end of this decade. And we could cut methane nearly in half. We could cut black carbon by probably nearly three quarters. And we could cut HFCs by nearly 100%. Right? Those, these can all be um, quite, quite thoroughly uh, dealt with via existing technology and existing solutions. And that's what the CCAC really provides is technical analysis, capacity building and support to put efforts into place, known solutions that have worked elsewhere in the world and to put those into place into countries that are, are committed to and eager to take action. If I could have the next slide, please. Wanted to talk a little bit about some of the achievements during the first 10 years of CCAC and, and there have been many, they don't all fit on, on one slide, but that's, that's one of the wonderful things about this coalition. It was formed as the coalition of the working and people have been hard at work. So we have the Breathe Life campaign with CCAC, UNEP and WHO and many, many cities around the world have become Breathe Life cities, really trying to put into place the kind of targeted uh, reductions in SLCPs that improve the quality of life for the citizens, as well as making a dent in climate change. We have the global methane assessment just came out last year, and that really linked together, you know, kind of filled in the, the dots between tackling methane, the economics of that, the benefits you get, and why this was, was both a critical and also quite practical um, effort. Be due to primarily to the, the relatively low costs and that helped catalyze the global methane pledge also launched last year by CCAC partners and that was uh, another uh, astonishing you know given the, the typical slow pace of policy um, by policy standards astonishingly fast growth kind of like the CCAC itself going from six countries to more than 70 over the 10 years the global methane pledge was first thought of late last year late 2021 and by this month over 100 countries are have signed on to the global methane pledge a really phenomenally quick uh, movement and the CCAC has campaigned globally to reduce HFCs, right? And the coalition was really a key Im implementer in getting Kigali um, put into place. And as, as we know, Kigali, uh, the Kigali amendment to the Montreal Protocol has gone into force. So we've seen a progression from the early days where CCAC was leading on some of the science and technical analysis to the current period where on, with development such as the Kigali Amendment and the Global Methane Pledge, we really moved into the space where countries around the world are committed to these reductions. They've announced and signed on to agreements to reduce them, and now CCAC can really help them figure out the best ways to meet these commitments rather than you know, trying to get them to make the commitments in the first place. So the CCAC has another hopefully as remarkable 10 years coming coming up as the past 10, but they will be focused in many ways on capacity building, technical support to, to implement the Kigali Agreement, to implement the Global Methane Pledge, and to continue our long running work on, on reducing black carbon rich sources as a way to especially improve air quality. 
and really helping countries see the link between climate between SLCP reductions, air pollution, and their sustainable development goals for both, including both public health and food security. So I'm very excited to, to hear from a couple of the countries that have, have taken action and are continuing to take action under CCAC. It's just gonna be a couple examples today, um, but I think that will really give us a flavor for what the CCAC as a whole is doing. Thank you all for joining, and I'm going to turn it back over to Denise to continue the day. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, your um, opening remarks reminds me of the start and strengthen um, principle or saying that's often quoted in the Montreal Protocol. And it seems that in the CCAC, that's also what we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, you know, it's not the joining of the countries and the action on NS SLCPs is not as fast as signing up to the Global Methane Pledge. But we've seen that really over the, ten the last 10 years, we've seen countries um, you know, move from having so many doubts about SLCPs to really get being convinced to the value of um, mitigating SLCPs. So we have two countries um, in South Asia that are examples of, you know, one that joined quite early uh, in the CCAC. Uh, and I think the interest was really on the Kigali Amendment, which is the Maldives. And then uh, more recently, Pakistan, that um, has been uh, very active in the CCAC, especially on the air quality actions. So our next speaker um, are, will be um, from the Ministry of Climate Change in Pakistan, Hadika. Um, she is known to us, you know, because she's been working on the SNAP uh, initiative uh, on uh, uh, on SLCP planning. Uh, she is uh, working currently as a climate change specialist at, at Pakistan's Ministry of Climate Change and supports the ministry in building climate resilience infrastructure for achieving NDCs and localizing carbon market tools for sustainable development and air pollution control in Pakistan. So I will not um, prolong any longer. Uh, you have the floor, Hadika. We're very excited to hear from Pakistan's experience. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much for uh, such a kind introduction. And uh, I'm really happy to be participating uh, in the session. Uh, so coming uh, coming to the presentation, uh, as we all know that uh, air pollution situation is uh, is is becoming increasingly alarming uh, all over the world and more specific for Pakistan. And uh, this is due to the uh, health uh, and and the economy uh, consequences uh, we are facing due to air pollution uh, around uh, 62 to 65 billion uh, per year uh, uh, we have to pay for the cost of air pollution related diseases and also the pm 2.5 data available for pakistan indicates that a country's average life uh, expectancy is experiencing a life uh, expectancy reduction of 2.7 years and uh, according to one World Bank research, uh, uh, Pakistan uh, incurs uh, around uh, 47.7 billion uh, of losses uh, due to health, which is around 6% of the GDP. And uh, if you talk about the crop yield, the reduction of crop yield between 35% uh, and it goes up to 46% as a result of ozone pollution. And that is also one of the uh, uh, one of a C uh, CL, uh, CL, uh, SLCP and would be equivalent to the loss of 1.8 uh, billion in present day terms if we if you look at it. So uh, uh, so in Pakistan uh, by 2030, uh, an estimated 90,000 uh, annual uh, deaths uh, due to outdoor air pollution is expected. And uh, to avoid this and near uh, near time climate change mitigation by implementing short lived climate pollutant reduction measures is very important. Uh, if you look at the GAG inventory of Pakistan, we can see that uh, uh, around 27% uh, of, of the emissions are coming from methane, which is around 135.89 uh, metric tons, uh, million metric tons of CO2. And uh, on this, uh, a total around 6.8 is coming from the energy, 3 is coming from uh, 3 and uh, uh, 2.9 is coming from fuel and the major is coming from agriculture sector, which is 109 and then the waste sector 19.2. Next slide, please. 
So uh, in, in the last year, Pakistan uh, revised uh, its second NDCs. Uh, the first one was submitted in uh, 2016, and we submitted the second NDCs in October 2021. And while uh, we were uh, revising the NDCs, uh, we kept in mind uh, the, the work we have, uh, we have been doing uh, with CCSC, uh, we, we partner since 2017, and uh, we have added very specific policy recommendations uh, regarding LEAP tool IBC uh, and uh, SLC uh, CP uh, reduction uh, in future in, in our NDCs. And uh, uh, with the uh, with the CCSC, we uh, we are working on different areas. Uh, one is on reducing uh, black carbon emission in the Br Brooklyn uh, sector, then uh, reducing methane emission from the rice uh, 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 crop, and also uh, integrating SLCP into Pakistan air quality and climate change plans, which uh, we are working currently on. Next slide, please. So together with a uh, uh, specific on the project, together with the uh, uh, CCSC and EC mode, uh, the government is uh, educating Brickling uh, makers uh, about uh, cost effective alternatives uh, to traditional clean technology uh, that will simultaneously reduce emissions and uh, produce health and agriculture benefits. Uh, in total, around 11,000 out of 20,000 20, traditional brick lane has, uh, have been converted to environmentally uh, smart technology. And it is basically uh, resulting in 60% of reduction in black carbon emissions, uh, almost around 40% reduction in uh, particular matter emissions, and 15% reduction in CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. So CCSA is supporting Pakistan through agriculture focused intervention where Pakistan is working with CCAC partners and local experts uh, to improve the sustainability of Pakistan rice sector uh, by reducing the methane emissions. And these activities will uh, include country specific scoping studies of SLCP, also uh, support in developing different concept nodes like NAMAS and also uh, associated uh, financial strategies and uh, preparing project proposal for low emission rice production. Uh, the project, uh, this uh, specific project uh, uh, tries to ensure that private sector engagement for driving technology uh, adoption and upscaling is very important for the sustainability in future and reduction of methane. And these activities are designed uh, usually to mitigate methane emission from rice production uh, that amount to almost 8% uh, uh, CO2 per year for Pakistan uh, and uh, emissions from uh, rice burning. Uh, that uh, contributes to the smog time period in Pakistan and also delivering co-benefits where uh, alternative uh, wetting and drying results in around 38% reduction in water use. Next slide, please. So building on uh, on the phase one of SLCP work in Pakistan, we are doing and uh, consultation uh, held with LEAP IBC assessment. Uh, we also uh, plan a second phase uh, which aims to build the capacity of provincial governments in Pakistan to make action in uh, SLCP uh, through the development of action plans uh, to reduce SLCPs and air pollutants. Uh, the project uh, uh, got approved and we are uh, in, in process of going towards implementation and the project is uh, basically strengthening the capacity of national partners through, uh, uh, through training of the LEAP IBC tool for analysis and also uh, uh, which is very useful for us is uh, the evaluating mitigation action which are most effective uh, and simultaneously improving air quality and miti uh, mitigating climate change as well. Next slide, uh, no, sorry, uh, 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 mitigation as well and uh, to this date, uh, if we look at it, uh, the project has uh, achieved uh, certain uh, objectives. Uh, we have developed a concept note to support uh, inclusion of uh, uh, SLCPs in Pakistan, a clean uh, air plan, which is in the process. Uh, we have trained national and subnational entities on the use of a LEAP IBC tool through series of trainings and workshop. Uh, we have also developed a national LEAP IBC analysis, uh, including the modeling of historical and future projection of emissions and uh, also the impacts and benefits while jointly uh, 
assessing green uh, gases and also uh, SLCPs and other air pollutants emission next to building mitigation scenarios. And uh, uh, it, it's also helping in understanding how emission reduction benefits uh, climate change, health and crops. And Stockholm Institute and Clean Air Asia are partnering uh, uh, with Ministry of Climate Change in the project and, uh, and they've been doing great work as well. Next slide, please. So uh, to cut the methane emission and uh, 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 to have fo some focus intervention for Pakistan, uh, we have recently joined the Global Methane Pledge uh, to cut uh, methane emission, uh, which was led by EU and US government on October 11, 2021 uh, to achieve uh, uh, the pledge goal of reducing global emission, uh, methane emission uh, by at least 30% uh, from 2020 uh, 20 to uh, levels by 2030 and moving towards uh, using best available inventory methodology uh, to quantify methane emission. Uh, the, uh, the main particular focus is on high emission source Pakistan uh, by joining the pledge, we plan to focus on developing uh, a tier two GHG inventory for the main methane emission um, uh, emitting sectors, which includes uh, agriculture, forest and fossil fuel, and also uh, to prepare a methane mitigation assessment for each sector that can be uh, used by Ministry of Climate Change, uh, also by provinces and relevant stakeholders, online ministry to report back to UNFCCC or on Pakistan NDC's implementation. Uh, uh, we plan to prepare recommendations on implementation pathway for methane mitigation measures, including cost of mitigation and to have, you know, clear roadmaps and rules and responsibilities defined uh, to have uh, some kind of uh, bankable projects uh, for methane reduction building on the methane emit emission uh, assessment can be identified. And um, uh, also, it's very important that we have uh, we deliver our MRV uh, framework for methane mitigation to uh, keep the transparency and the monitoring and reporting uh, element in mind. Next slide, please. So MSCC uh, uh, have uh, restarted the work uh, on Pakistan Clean Air Program after the uh, after realizing that uh, provinces lack the capacity and uh, support to carry things forward. Uh, uh, and CCSC support has been very vital in uh, in this. And we're uh, uh, not only national plans uh, uh, are are you know strengthened in a way but also uh, implementation capacity of provinces has has been enhanced we can see in in the uh, in the workshops we have conducted for leap ibc uh, tool there has been uh, a lot of um, interest uh, from the provincial stakeholders the technical people and they have been coming to mocc with uh, with uh, with some comments like they, they are learning new things and uh, the capacity has been enhanced uh, and also uh, environmental sustainability is at the heart of every initiative taken by pa Pakistan in the, with the current government and Pakistan has clear goals of climate change and air pollution. Uh, and uh, we do realize that this is more of a collective uh, effort we have to take with all the provinces. And also uh, air quality uh, improvement and climate change mitigation go hand in hand for uh, for us and for future projects, uh, prospects and on carbon market, for example, or emission trading, uh, uh, maybe investing in clean technology, uh, focusing on gender, also intervention, etc. are targeted uh, towards this. And and uh, MOCC in Pakistan is looking forward to new opportunities offered by CCSC. And Pakistan has also become the first CCSC national planning hub to uh, to focus on SLCP mitigation programs to uh, help Pakistan meet climate commitment and global methane pledge. And we recently had a meeting uh, uh, past uh, to, to uh, in the past week, and uh, there was a good uh, fruitful discussion. And I think uh, the overall goal and everyone is on the same page that really we really move, want to move towards the implementation and um, to have uh, more uh, you know action level plans and bankable projects so that uh, it can uh, show some results thank you so much thank you hadika hadika will um, leave soon so i wanted to ask you a question um, if you can turn on your camera so I just realized that it was off. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No, I just wanted to ask you one um, question. Um, for you, in your experience, what was the most difficult challenge in like convincing, um, you know, decision makers on the importance on SLCP mitigation, or at least the relationship of air quality 
with uh, climate change because one that's one of the most difficult um, uh, you know things to do to start uh, an SLCP uh, project in a country. So basically uh, uh, as i say that it's more difficult for us to explain climate change and con uh, convince people on climate change than on air pollution because uh, if you uh, if you have seen some pictures uh, of the smog period in pakistan it's quite real people can see and people do face a lot of issues which uh, when it comes to health uh, when it comes to even there's a lot of accidents uh, during that time as well so people living in punjab in the area where they, there's a severe problem of smog uh, they they do realize that this is an issue so uh, we use uh, climate air pollution as a shield actually when we are selling uh, mitigation related uh, measures for pakistan uh, specifically if i talk about carbon markets i remember that when we used to talk initially back after like uh, four years ago or something so uh, the main policy makers also used to say that you know this is not our problem we are not we are not the country who emits a lot of emissions we need to focus on adaptation so using uh, air pollution as a co benefit uh, really helped uh, us as policy makers to uh, to convince uh, other stakeholders as well to uh, to uh, to actually work towards the mitigation of climate change so it's an other way around and the other uh, problem was the alignment with the provinces because uh, due to 18 amendment the implementation lies with the provinces so uh, but at the federal level, we can we can make the policies, we can do the international negotiations and, you know, uh, deals with their climate finance. But when it comes to implementation of it, uh, you need to rely on the provinces and everyone is they have the uh, they have the autonomy to make the decisions. So with this leap, I be see uh, tool uh, very specifically. We have seen that uh, a good representation from the provinces uh, where people have been uh, sharing some data of, 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 from each provinces as 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 they're representing and uh, a very good analysis. Analysis uh, has been developed. Uh, I have, I'm pretty sure Johan will touch upon that as well. So this was an issue which we tried to resolve that we want to keep even in the methane uh, work we are we are planning to take it forward with CCAC. Uh, we have very specifically uh, identified two three areas. One is to develop you know a better GAG uh, inventories uh, moving from tier one to tier two, but also to uh, enhance the alignment uh, and uh, give more ownership to the provinces and to bridge the gap so that the implementation can be better and we can identify projects uh, because uh, this new uh, after this uh, 2021, uh, the whole uh, focus is on uh, to have more action than uh, developing more policy documents. That's the main aim we are looking at. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Yes, you did. And I think it's a really important lesson for many of the developing country partners of the CCAC, especially those who have very bad um, air pollution episodes. So thank you so much for, for uh, your presentation and for, for sharing the experience of Pakistan. We will now move to the next country. Um, a small island developing state uh, that, as, as I mentioned earlier, joined the CCAC um, early on. Um, our speaker is Ms. Fatika Adnan. She is an environmental analyst at the Environmental Management and Conservation Department of the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Technology. So welcome, Fatika. Please go ahead with your uh, presentation. Thank you, Denise. Um... So to give a brief introduction about us, uh, Maldives being a low-lying state is very vulnerable to the consequences of global warming, uh, which is uh, contributed by SLCPs. And um, urban air and urban air pollution is a growing concern in the greater Malay region, the capital Malay having an area of 1.95 square kilometers is extremely consistent with a population density of 78,925 people per square kilometer in uh, 2014, according to the 2014 census. And uh, this is a major source for SLCPs. And uh, currently there is limited capacity policies, information on and mechanisms in place uh, specifically for air quality management and the management of a short lived climate pollutants. Um, next slide, please. So uh, when we look into the Maldives and the CCSC, Maldives joined the CCSC coalition in the year 2012 uh, to complement its pursuit of a low, low emission uh, climate development plan. 
uh, under the supporting national action uh, and uh, planning SNAP initiative of the CCAC, the national action plan on air pollutants of Maldives was uh, formulated in the year 2019. And our uh, technical support was extended towards the formulation and publishing of the cost benefit assessment for introducing a uh, 10 ppm sulfur fuel and Euro 6 emission standard in the Maldives in the year 2021. And uh, under the CCS's uh, HFC initiative, Maldives established a national HFC inventory in the year 2013, which will support the HFC phase down commencing in the year 2024. Next slide, please. So looking into some of the details of these works, we have done um, HFC inventory, which was uh, done under the initiative of CCS in 2013. Uh, it provided us with an insight on sector by sector use patterns. And it also provided us with a better understanding of the use and potential growth of HFCs. And uh, this inventory also pro provides a starting point for support towards the HFC uh, phase down commencing in 2024, as I've mentioned before. Um, next slide, please. And now looking into the findings of the feasibility study conducted on district cooling in 2013, uh, this study presents the estimation of HFC consumption growth uh, its potential or uh, direct emission based on the historical consumption patterns and the potential of using a uh, low GWP energy efficient uh, substitutes in the Maldives. And the conclusion of this study showed that the that very substantial reductions of emitted greenhouse gases can be achieved by introducing our uh, district cooling in the development areas of Hurumale, which is our neighboring city being developed currently next to our capital city, Male, and it's connected to uh, Male by a bridge. Uh, however, this uh, sadly, this study was found unfeasible in the capital city, Male. Next slide, please. Uh, looking into the national planning of Maldives uh, through the coalitions uh, supporting our national action and planning initiative, uh, Maldives' first national action plan on air pollutants or NEP was formulated in the year 2019, as I've mentioned before. And our NEP outlines 28 mitigation measures across major three uh, priority source sectors. And uh, these sectors include waste, uh, electricity generation, and uh, transport. The national total emission of SLCPs, air pollutants, and uh, greenhouse gases were quantified and uh, projected from 2010 to 2030, and their mitigation potentials were deduced. And uh, in addition to this, NEP also assessed the core benefits of actions proposed and prioritized the most relevant measures at a uh, national scale. And uh, NEP also identified ways to promote and implement the mitigation measures. Furthermore, NEP also incorporated SLCPs into existing plans and activities where they were not considered before. Next slide, please. So uh, our next national action plan also identifies the core benefits of action and all the possible ways to mainstream uh, further action on SLCPs into existing strategies, uh, policies, and plans. And uh, Furthermore, it encourages our plan implementation of existing strategies, policies, and uh, plans, and or, or creating new actions in the sectors of emission or sources. And it will also sustain the efforts or, of action on SLCPs. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on to our future plans, as uh, I mentioned before, we, we are about to start phase down of HFC in the year 2024. And uh, in Maldives, we are also about to start works on the project titled Data Collection for Coal Chain, which will uh, provide support towards the commencement of HFC phase down plan. And in addition to this, Maldives has also started monitoring regional air quality in various regional hotspots throughout the country via deployment of low cost air quality monitoring sensors. And uh, furthermore, there is an establishment of a reference grade air quality monitoring station in the Greater Amala region through the Integrated Low Emission Project and uh, the Integrated Sustainable and Low Emission Transport in Maldives Project. Next slide. 
so uh, Maldives uh, is also expanding its work to tackle SLCP emission in the future with plans to monitor and mitigate SLCPs and air pollutants in place, including the regional air quality monitoring program. Um, and in line with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition's 2030 strategy, Maldives has also shown interest towards joining the planning hub plus uh, various sector-based hubs launched, uh, namely waste cooling, household energy, heavy-duty vehicles, and engines and fossil fuels. So to conclude, it has uh, been very valuable to get support from the CCSE because uh, through NEP for the first time, the Ministry of Environment, uh, Climate Change and Technology has uh, developed compiled and uh, quantified the reductions in air pollutants for measures originally developed to reduce the national greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fatika. Um, I would just like to remind our audience that if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll address them, uh, you know, uh, during the panel discussion, but I did have one question for you, Fatika. Um, are, is your camera on? I wasn't sure. But um, yeah, my question is like, you know, in all of these, you know, all of the activities that the Maldives is doing, you are obviously a very small team. How have you coped with um, the COVID pandemic and, you know, your targets? For example, there's HFC, you know, reduction by 2024 or freeze. So how, how are you as a small island developing state um, coping with, uh, with these COVID challenges? Fatika, are you there? Your mic is muted if you are speaking. Oh, sorry, I'm having some connection problems. Um, can you repeat the question because I didn't hear it uh, because of the yeah. connection. No problem. So I, I just wanted to ask, like, because there's so much to do um, in the last, you know, in the next years and COVID is there as well, posing challenges. So how has COVID um, affected, you know, the implementation and actions on SLCPs in the Maldives? Um, if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, I think, uh, Fatika has disconnected, so, Later on, if uh, you know she comes back, we can come back to my question. Uh, so in the meantime, I think it's good to proceed to the next um, part of our webinar, which is a very inter interesting panel discussion. So I'll first introduce all of our panelists. They are um, uh, they are from NGOs uh, that have been very active in the CCAC in terms of. Um, working with our countries to address SLCPs. So our first um, panelist is uh, known to many, Johan. I will not attempt again your family name. <laughs> he is a research leader at uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute. Prior to this role, he was the center director for the SCI Center in York from 97 to 2012 policy director from 2013 to 2019 and joined SEI in 1989. So that would tell us how much experience he has. He's a member of the scientific advisory panel of the CCAC. And as you know, um, SEI has been involved in many of the initiatives, especially SNAP. Um, our next um, panelist is um, Dang Espita Casanova. She's my compatriot from the Philippines. Uh, she is a program manager of Clean Air Asia and has been with the organization since 2014. She oversees program development and strategic planning for Clean Air Asia's impact initiatives on transport, energy, and urban air quality management. And our last panelist is Dr. Pri Makumara, who is a principal researcher and director of the IGES Center collaborating with UNEP on environmental technologies and provides technical support for developing countries 
in improving waste and resource management. He has 30 years of experience, though you look very young, um, like Johan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so the way we're going to do it is uh, we have, um, you know, 30 minutes for this panel discussion and we'd like to really provide an opportunity for our panelists to, you know, to speak and cover all of the uh, three main questions that we have. Um, so we'll first um, devote our question to Johan. And Johan, as mentioned, you have around th three minutes to answer this, and then the other panelists can also provide anything additional, or if they want to react on what you said, that's also uh, welcome. Okay, so Johan, our question for you is, what is the role of NGO partners in SLCP mitigation, and how the collaboration with the CCAC has produced better results for countries? And I think, uh, yeah, we can talk forever, but three minutes, please. Um, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, so the first thing I'd like to say that, you know, it's been 10 years now that the CCAC has been active. And in those 10 years, the CCAC has helped to facilitate that 17 nationally determined contributions now include SLCPs in them um, and air pollutants and, and has led to the development of 10 national SLCP plans. And um, the initiative, the SNAP initiative, has supported about 30 countries in total in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Now, it's also significant that countries that have not had specific support from CCAC have also included air pollutants, um, air pollution in their NDCs, um, something the CCAC has been promoting over these 10 years. And this is because of the recognition that integrating air pollution into climate plans leads to local benefits. So it's a good thing for countries to do and is strongly linked to the SLCP and climate mitigation and, and can increase climate ambition. So this is related to the building of a community of practice on this issue that goes wider than the CCAC. The CCAC messaging has also permeated to major players um, that are helping to write NDCs. So I think that one of the most significant impacts that the SECAC has had with NGO support um, is the building of a community of practitioners in countries focusing on reducing SLCPs from a situation where SLCPs were not included in any policy development. In 2012, we had the UNEP WMO assessment, which um, Drew alluded to, um, and it, it, it was scientific studies, but it showed the enormous potential, but there was no community of practice. So the CCAC, um, with lead partners made up of NGOs and national representatives, have led the development of the SNAP initiative, creating a space for countries and NGOs to meet and discuss SLCP mitigation. So it's a really big step forward that countries have engaged um, in national SLCP planning, but also importantly, there have been many opportunities for countries to meet each other, compare their situations and discuss progress and issues they face. So don't feel they're doing it alone. And the engagement with the CCAC SNAP initiative has enabled them to exchange best practices and help countries to promote emission mitigation. And this means that those um, practitioners from the different countries engaged in CCAC and the SNAP initiative um, have been able to develop a community of people who feel that's part of something bigger, something beyond individual national effort, efforts um, and can help to get the scale of emission reductions identified in 2012. And if I'm allowed to, Denise, um, just say a, a bit more about the role of NGOs in enhancing capacity. So the progress that um, has been made at national scales is not possible without enhancing the capacity to make sure that people um, like those, those uh, practitioners in the Maldives and Pakistan have the ability to develop assessments and plan and develop their planning processes themselves. So SEI um, has had a role with other SCI, uh, NGO um, specialist institutions to train people in countries in the use of tools and developing planning processes. And, um, you know, showing that the different air pollution and climate action planning um, you know, can be supported with technical issues, policy guidance, and institutional relationships. 
And part of this has been in the use of training in appropriate tools, and we heard of the use of LEAP IBC. And we've trained about 30 countries in the use of this tool, which specifically links the SRCPs, greenhouse gas and air pollutants in the way that Hadika was saying was so important, and um, enhancing the integration of air quality and climate planning. So the important thing there, of course, is that countries are able to undertake their own analyses. And so, you know, we've been training people, but also tailoring it to the needs and situation in the countries. So in Pakistan, it was important to do it for the four provinces. And in the Maldives, it was important to develop the air quality plan that was missing in that countries, but making sure that SLCPs are incorporated. Um, and just finally, I'd say that, you know, the CCAC has managed to maintain long-term relationships with countries. And that's how the NGOs have been most effective, not in terms of short-term projects, but a long-term effort. And we must uh, make sure we sustain the capacity um, to make sure we get those emission reductions um, into the future as well. So I think I better stop there before I keep going on. Thanks, Johan. Dan or um, Kumara? Yes, thank you so much, um, Denise. I think uh, I just wanted to underline and also follow through with what you once said about uh, communities of practice really supporting the integration work. Um, I mean, starting from building the knowledge base in, for example, co collecting air pollutant um, data, understanding emission sources, of course, up to the process of um, integrated clean air and climate action planning and down to the implementation of measures, not only, of course, at the national level, but uh, really um, uh, cascading this at the at the local and community levels even. And this is also where um, I also think that, um, you know, um, really convening that coalition of NGOs and change makers um, can really benefit us in terms of uh, like bringing in a transdisciplinary approach to stakeholder engagement, which most importantly, of course, captures the local context for us to also be able to craft solutions that uh, really are directed towards, uh, you know, the specific needs of uh, our uh, beneficiaries and partners. And this is also where I think we can also talk about more uh, later the role of city leaders in really steering this uh, through political uh, policy, um, technological, and institutional capacity building inf interventions, which um, which Johan also underlined earlier. So thank you. Mara. Thanks, uh, Jenny. I also want to add something like uh, both the uh, early panelists have already mentioned. I think there were two, two ways that the NGOs is very important. One is uh, uh, the working with the national and the local governments to take actions on, on the SLCP. So that is one, one thing because they are very much in line with what the, the, the local context and then they can work with the national and the local governments in, in building their capacities and then science-based evidence uh, to, to make the policies. And another way I feel it's also important that the NGOs are more involved with the CCSA secretariat because activities, because they can bring their knowledge working at the ground with these national and the local governments to the policy decisions where the CCSA secretariat is taking. So real message from the from the ground to the to the policy process. So in that way, I, I feel there is a two way uh, kind of a role what the uh, NGOs are, are, can be play. And also we found working with, because uh, IGS uh, working in the last 10 years in the, with the CCC and uh, working with the national and the local governments, uh, especially in the waste sector. So there were two type of, uh, again, uh, the NGOs. One is uh, the, like uh, the currently we are here, ACI or the Clean Asia or IGS, uh, we call international NGOs. They are mostly working it, and also we find found local NGOs who are the very important in the in this process. Where are the other ones who work with the governments that can implement in these activities. So, uh, how these uh, local NGOs uh, build their capacities and, and understanding this uh, SLCP importance and then work with the governments is also I feel 
uh, in the in the in the long term it's very important uh, as a, as ngos in that case uh, ngo network and the regional ngo partnership platforms and then these are, are very very important yes thank you yes you make a really good point i was just thinking about you know when building capacity in governments, the local NGOs would be also good to in, be included in that, you know, national capacity building and and the international NGOs who, as Johan mentioned, build you know, experience in the last 10 years, learning from each other and building on each other's strengths has really been key. Of course, there are, uh, you know, still some challenges, but, but yes, that, those are very interesting insights from you guys. Um, let's move to the next question, and uh, I'd like to invite Dang to be the first to answer this. Um, Dang, why is it a good investment to invest in these kinds of policy actions, especially for developing countries? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Denise. Um, I think uh, with uh, it's undeniable that urbanization will continue to grow, and of course, um, with this growth, the threats of increased air and climate emissions are also um, increasing. And of course, this further places cities um, at the forefront in a critical position to push forward uh, integrated solutions through policies, technologies, um, infrastructure, and institutional capacity building. Now, since we also recognize cities as hubs of innovation, uh, meaning uh, it's really rich in terms of you know, economic, financial, technical, intellectual activities. Um, this renders cities a uh, unique characteristic of um, having a, like a distinct lens in assessing um, clean air and climate investment opportunities, as well as, of course, very appropriate and distinct approaches to assess the barriers and how such barriers can be overcome. And through, um, I think through our work, um, especially in the past uh, three to five years, we continue to see that there's a steady growth in the city's awareness and recognition of the co-benefits brought about by integrated interventions in, of course, addressing both um, air pollution and climate change, and uh, as well as really um, underlining uh, how this can be mainstreamed in development planning and uh, growth as well. And uh, further, we, we also saw, saw that um, during the onset of the pandemic, uh, the cities have become more interested to invest in projects that protect health. So, for example, um, these interventions include uh, sustainable urban mobility. And I think with this motivation, there's a growing appetite for cities to really look into climate and air pollution related projects with common activities or sectoral like work such as um, active mobility, energy efficiency measures, even renewable energy generation and green spaces expansion, which we all know all of these have or can harness air quality, climate and health co-benefits. Now, I think it's very important for cities to consider carefully, very carefully investment in these uh, types of projects because they have this um, distinct and uh, like significant mandate or authority over various development priorities as well as basic, like the delivery of basic municipal services, um, including public health, like protecting the public health of their constituents. And so they are in a strategic position to fully harness such co-benefits for from such um, projects. And uh, what we really are also, uh, I mean, what we wanted cities to really consider is that since resources are finite and indeed there are competing um, demands for a limited resource within the local governments, it is uh, really practical for them and useful for them to adopt an integrated approach that is grounded on evidence like data and information and um, really zooms in on sector activity, but at the same time um, have that uh, broad and overarching um, lens to also tackle um, development issues uh, that uh, go with, um, you know, the sectoral emission uh, issues. And with this, I think this circles back to the importance again of, um, you know, having uh, this facilitation of collaborative actions and really working with a lot of 
um, partners and stakeholders that um, uh, support and uh, are aware of uh, what are the benefits of such integrated actions. Thank you, Dang. That's very interesting. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll invite uh, Johan first or Kumara to add anything. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, Dang has covered most of it. But I, I think to emphasize then that if we really want action, we have to show the relevance um, to of the actions that we want to promote to key development priorities of countries. And over the last 10 years, we've been able to help countries generate scientific evidence that is required to provide persuasive arguments as to why the ministries of planning and finance should put pressure on sectoral ministries to take action. And so we've been helping um, that process as part of the broader planning process and, and making sure that we engage across government um, and then get agreements at a high governmental level. And an important part of CCAC's offer to the world has been um, the concentration on achieving multiple development benefits of action. So the CCAC has been providing quantitative arguments like the impacts on health from reducing air pollution, showing the relevance to development and then attracting the notice of these important ministries who've got the money and the power. And the regional assessments which have been, uh, or different assessments that have been coming from CCAC have encouraged countries by outlining the local benefits um, of addressing SLCPs and the global methane assessment has looked even more broadly now. So looking at um, outcomes such as the impact on asthma and of heat stress um, and expanded the economic benefits of action. And so all of these things make the measures attractive for policymakers to implement. So I think that this is the, 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 the key points that we have to make um, make it seem like it's very relevant to the country's development plans. It seems very, you know, like if I were uh, the CCAC focal point in my country, what I'm, 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 you know, getting from this is, you know, you have to tailor your message depending on who you're talking with. Because, for example, Dang's experience is, you know, what she's saying is, you know, talking with cities and politicians who also want to see results very quickly but at the same time um johan is making a point of you know the 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 national you know how it relates to the developmental priorities of the countries um so i guess you know as mentioned there should be you know as a ccac focal point as somebody who wants to make this happen you have to learn to to communicate um, with different um, decision makers that you you want to convince. Um, what do you think about that, Kumara? And from your experience, what has been you know a, an effective message to convince countries to invest on such actions? I think this is very very important. Uh... Correction, actually, uh, because uh, early also when I hearing the the Pakistan presentation, what her final uh, uh, like a point is, so they have already developed the plans, but but they need not the plans. So how how to move the plans into the to the implementation? I think that's that's the way we need investment to 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 make them a reality in, in the plans to make them implementation. So in that sense, I, I agree with Dan. So that. Uh, in the political wise, we also work with the waste management activities. So with the cities need implementation. So city mayors need something to do quickly because they have only three, four years in during their their official period in the office. So they want to make and something and, and solve something changes. So they, this need the, the investment. So but at the same time, how this investment is is in line with the, the national planning and, and allocating budget in the, in the fair manner, this uh, I, with, I I agree with the with the uh, uh, need the national level uh, uh, systems. But a couple of things what we also see the uh, the 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 governments also need to take some actions uh, to create the additional funding mechanisms uh, along with this. Uh, SLCP plans to implementation. So, and CCSE also need to uh, need to help in, in creating more funding. And because in the waste sector, what we found in the, the 
when looking at the global uh, climate fund, so the, the allocation for the waste, uh, waste sector funding is very low, so very, very poor. So in that case, I think like the CCAC, uh, the, the contribution in, in, the, in, the, in the creating more, more opportunity for the, for the funding, so the investment for the, the governments and the, and the cities to implement their action plan is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Kumara. Um, and uh, Dang has also, just for everyone's information, shared in the chat about um, an event tomorrow. They are hosting a workshop called Clean Air Solutions Webinar. IBAQ's program, no, IBAQ programs regional training on air quality financing, which um, would be very interesting uh, in relation to this topic. So she also sent the registration link there. Um, we have a final question uh, that uh, we would like uh, Kumara this time to answer first. So Kumara, uh, and this is, I think, we'd, we'd welcome again, Johan to, and Dang to add on this. Uh, in your perspective, what action do we need to take now to achieve climate and clean air goals by 2030? So I, I think this is, uh, this is very broad, but uh, I, but I feel like uh, as the, the, the early presentation also mentioned, so the scientific evidence is very clear. So the countries need to take a bold commitment and the actions to reduce short light climate pollutant, SLCPs, uh, including both methane and the black carbon to achieve 1.5 targets. So now only uh, the decarbonization measures uh, is not enough to, to achieve 1.5 measures. So, that is very clear. And in that case, uh, the CCAC recent publications, so the methane uh, reports, the global methane reports, everything. So how we can achieve, uh, need to achieve the methane reduction. And we also find black carbon is also very important in, in, in the, when we discussing air pollution and the activities. So based on my experience, uh, working with national uh, planning and the waste management uh, initiatives and now newly uh, waste management hub, improving waste management is also one of the critical in reducing both the methane and the, and the black carbon because we know that the most of our developing countries, uh, more than 50% uh, in some countries, it's 70, 80% is organic waste. So go to the landfill. That is the, the most highest uh, methane uh, generated from the, from the countries. And also they don't have much waste collection because recently we are conducting a study in ASEAN countries, three ASEAN countries, to understand the waste open burning, municipal waste open burning. So we found more than 30%, 40% is waste is burning because lack of waste collection services so in the in the cities. So it's very clear uh, the, the issue is we need more actions to take uh, these things. So in that case, we found like a CCAC is very important in, in, in educating capacity building, training, creating infrastructure, science-based evidence to the cities and the countries to understand the, the, the issue and take action. So in that case, so CCAC engagement is strategy where I am working with the waste sector. So we identified these two methane and the, and the black carbon is very important to, to reduce from the waste sector. But this need to be more holistic because in the cities, waste management is a system needs system change. So it should be more holistic, uh, reducing organic waste and converting them to composting or the, or the biogas and improving landfill site and increasing the waste collection services and, and, and monitoring the, the systems and incentives. All are, are need to be considered as a holistic manner when they make it. I think this is very similar to other one, other 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 activities also, agriculture or, or diesel, this all are something systems need to be changed in more holistic manner. In that case, we feel like a, based on our experience in the in the in the last uh, 10 years, so these activities had to be two different ways. Within the countries, we need more vertical or integrated activities from the cities because we are talking, especially I'm talking waste, it's mostly the implementation is by the cities, but the policies at the national level. So we need the uh, vertical inter inter 
integration between the cities and the, and the national policies. And at the same time, we need the uh, horizontal integration. The cities need to work with other partners. So, and also cities can work with the other cities. Cities can learn with the other cities. So it's more horizontal uh, partnership. So in that case, uh, we, we, it is very important how uh, CCAC is the, the, the working with these uh, systems to help the countries to improve the, the, the situation. For that, uh, actually, I, I feel CCSE is already now have good systems. So we have 10 years experience already, uh, and we created some systems and the, and the national planning system and the hubs, how the national planning and the hubs can work together in, in making the country. So these are uh, very, very important, I feel, in the next 10 years. So thank you. Thank you, Kumara. Um, Dang. Yes, thank you. And I think um, Kumara was able to already uh, wrap up that uh, very good or those very good uh, points. I think um, I just wanted to reiterate really the importance of um, capacity building and this uh, really transcends from the local to the subnational and the national levels. Um, I think uh, based on, of course, the available, the available tools and data uh, you know, all the considerations that we need not only to develop and uh, not only to develop integrated uh, air and climate action plans, but really to implement um, the low hanging fruits and even those, uh, you know, actions that are that would require time and resource to, to take on. But really, um, capacity building is key. And when I say capacity building, it's really institutionalizing that capacity um, in terms of technical and perhaps manpower that uh, would really bring us to closer to achieving our 2030 and 2050 targets. So that's it for me. Thanks, Dan. Johan? Well, um, what we we heard um, from, you know, IGES reminded me that we need to throw all of the skills that we have within CCAC at these problems. So we've been working with IGES in Thailand, um, particularly with Eric Sussman and, and colleagues, um, and they've been putting their in knowledge of institutional relationships um, in there in order to um, make practical suggestions for how there can be further integration of climate and air quality um, planning you know so it, it's it's that sort of knowledge and expertise which exists needs to be thrown at this and the other thing I was going to say was that the national plans have identified very specific measures that are priorities for countries and quantify the benefits of implementing them so now the, the key is to if we're going to achieve significant gains by 2030 we need to move forward with the implementation to improve air quality and realize the goals of global methane pledge for example our next step is to support countries to develop detailed implementation plans or roadmaps, identifying in, in the, the level of detail required to move things forward about who will do what at what scale and where the resources are going to come from. And as well as emphasizing international finance, it's important to influence the allocation of national budgets as well, which means we need close relationships with the ministries of finance and planning. And um, I just wonder if we can also consider the potential of regional approaches to push forward certain policy options that are of interest to all countries in a region. And we've got a couple of examples of that, such as fuel quality in East Africa, for example. So, you know, that's another route by which we can try and get action at scale as well. Thank you, Johan. We have um, eight years to 2030. Um, and there's lots of suggestions and ideas on how to get there, but um, we also have the strength of the partnership, indeed the NGO partners, as well as the international governmental organizations, and of course our governments um, at the forefront of our fight uh, for climate and clean air. So thank you very much to our panelists um, for this interesting discussion. Unfortunately, we don't have more time to go deeper, but hopefully we will be able to, you know, organize more um, discussions and 
talk uh, with the countries directly on some of these issues. So um, before we end and wrap up, uh, I just wanted to invite everyone. We also have another webinar featuring Colombia and Nigeria um, this afternoon. Um, that would be uh, uh, afternoon Paris time. Um, and also more importantly, not really more importantly, but uh, also I wanted to uh, uh, please share the slides, my colleagues, <laughs> to invite you to the 10th anniversary ministerial meeting. That's going to be um, uh, April, on April 1st. Uh, it's going to be a virtual event and everyone is welcome to attend. So we are in expecting um, lots of ministers, um, hopefully making good announcements and, um, you know, feeding our motivation to really act fast on SLCPs. So, um, again, if you'd like more information about those events, please feel free to um, visit the website of the CCAC um, and register for those events. Everyone is welcome. So again, we'd like to thank everyone who joined in this uh, morning session and um, uh, yeah, okay, now it's showing. So yes, please visit um, our website for that uh, ministerial meeting registration. Um, everyone is welcome. Thank you to all our speakers from the countries, Patika, Hadika, and um, Johan, Dang, and Kumara, and of course, as well to Drew for opening. We hope that um, everyone found this interesting. We will be sharing the presentations online as well as the recording of this uh, webinar uh, so that we can also share to um, other colleagues and, and friends that may be interested. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice um, evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you are located. Bye. Thanks, Chase. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.